We're joined by Vice President and James E. Rohr, Director of Athletics, Jack Swarbrick. If you do have a question, please use the raise hand function and we will call on you when it's your turn. But first, we're going to start with an opening statement. Uh, thank you. We, we did a version of this uh, late in the summer um, in anticipation of the semester ahead, and we thought it would be good to, uh, at this point, on the back end of that same semester, to have the same opportunity. And so thanks to all of you uh, who have joined us today. Uh, look forward to um, having a discussion about the things that are of interest to you and answering any questions you have. As a preliminary matter, I'd just say how, how proud I am sitting uh, today reflecting back on what has been an incredibly challenging year. Um, extraordinarily proud of this university. The decision it made, one of the first in the country to return to class and the way in which it implemented that decision. Uh, we knew it wouldn't be um, easy. We knew progress wouldn't be linear, um, but it was the goodwill of the people here and their resolve to maintain the residential educational model that saw us through. And so enormous pride in the university. Um, and, and the standard it set, it, it, it set a standard that in large part dictated the decisions we made in athletics. When Father John made his decision to return to on-campus education, it was effectively a charge to us to implement our part of that educational model, which was athletics. So I was pleased we were able to do that as part of the university's initiative. Very proud of the conference and our colleagues in the conference, the way we were able to work together. Um, we all spent more time together virtually than we ever could have imagined uh, eight months ago. Uh, but through all that, I, I, I think we had great discussions, um, made the best decisions we could, and when they turned out not to be exactly the right ones, we, we figured out a way to modify them. But there was always such a great spirit of cooperation and it resulted in some remarkable achievements uh, that we were able not just to get a full season of football in and to build a schedule which allowed us the flexibility to do that, but that we, we competed in the other sports. We, we established early on that that was very important to us, uh, that it wouldn't be a decision about just playing football, that if it would be a decision about participating in the fall sports and that we, that we were able to accomplish that is also a source of pride. But, but finally and primarily, it's the student athletes um, and our coaches and staff who support them. Um, I have been amazed every day throughout this period, and I recognize we're in the midst of it. It's, there are worse days ahead right now. Um, but throughout all of that, the resilience of our students their willingness to sacrifice, um, they, they have just amazed at every turn. And in part, they've done that because of the nature of the young men and women they are, but also because of the leadership of our coaches, um, who in their own decision making, always made clear that the students' health and safety was their first concern. And with that, with that as a platform, we were able to make collective decisions, students, coaches, administration, about how to move forward. And, and from this perspective, um, accomplished a lot um, and were able to largely meet our goals in terms of protecting the health and safety. So um, it's been a remarkable journey, one none of us could have ever anticipated. Again, I recognize it continues, and in many ways the spring is going to present a whole new set of challenges for us. Um, but even in the midst of it, enormous pride in, in, my, in our university, in our conference, and in the people who work here and the students who choose to go to school here. With that, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. And as a reminder, please use the raise hand function if you do have a question. We're going to start with Tom Noy of the South Bend Tribune. Jack, I'm going to start with some college basketball. How, how do you see this season playing out and being able to get to March and April? And then also, what was your reaction or maybe your advice to Mike when you saw his non-conference schedule this season? Um, I think it's going to be a mess. Um, and, and 
Um, I, I think we went into it um, with the knowledge that it would present a special challenge. It presents a special challenge um, because of contact tracing in basketball, the, the size of the squad, the nature of the time together. Now we're doing a lot of things to try and manage that. Um, we're using technology that helps measure um, relative distances and time between players and coaches, which is very helpful to us. Same system the NBA used, the SEC is using it too. Um, but despite that, you can see already the challenges. Um, and, and I think it's going to continue throughout much of the basketball year. Um, we, we, we debated a lot of different approaches. Um, I, I, for one, was in favor of probably just the conference-only schedule. Um, I was a strong advocate for an all-comers postseason tournament. Uh, I still regret we didn't head to that because I think you're going to have such differences in the number of games played and the nature of games that postseason selection is going to be very, very difficult. And so I, I, I wish I'd been more effective at selling the all-comers uh, notion. In this environment, with all the uncertainty, um, I was Mike's biggest cheerleader in developing the schedule he developed. Uh, my, my, my view was, this is the year to do this. Let's, let's, let's take a shot at this. Um, our guys have gone so long waiting to play again. They're excited to play. Um, would we build this same preseason schedule in a normal year? No. Um, but this felt like the year to do it. I think we'll learn a lot from it. Uh, my big regret with it is we have all these marquee games and no audience. Um, which is more than a little bit of a frustration, but really proud of, proud of Mike for taking this on and, and love the enthusiasm of, of the guys as reflected in a, in a great effort um, against the very good Ohio State team last night. We'll go next to Pete Sampson. Uh, Jack, uh, I was curious if you could sort of give us a play-by-play -play of the cancellation of the Wake Forest game um, in terms of your communication with the ACC, and then also just sort of what that back and forth confirmed or told you about the strength of the relationship between Notre Dame and the conference. Well, like all, all decisions we've made uh, throughout the season, it, it started with a discussion among all of the athletic directors um, about how to handle uh, the last week or weeks of the season and uh, was referred then to the football working group, which is a combination of ADs and coaches. Um, I'd give you the membership of that, but I'd get it wrong. I, I serve on the basketball working group and other ADs serve on the football working group. Um, and, you know, at, at the core of the discussion – was the reality that you had three teams with the possibility of playing um, in, the, in the conference championship. And the way the calendar set up, at the point the discussion was, was being made, um, if, if you know, we, were, we were in a good position relative to knowing we would be in it, um, if Clemson beat Virginia Tech, it was going to be in it. And so we were really focused on how do, you, how do we ensure um, a fair selection if Clemson were upset by Virginia Tech? And the notion there was we need all teams that are eligible to have played the same number of games. And so the only way to accomplish that was to have Miami play this week um, while Clemson and, and Notre Dame didn't. And that way all teams would have, all three teams would have had the same number of games and you would have had um, a, clear, a clear form of comparison, right, um, to, to look at after that was over. Um, and so that, that, was the, that was sort of the cornerstone of it. Um, from my perspective, um, I also thought, although this wasn't a focus of the conversation, 
I, I also thought that having played as many games as, as collectively we did as a conference um, and, that, that, and knowing that two teams would play in that conference championship, um, we, there, was, there was benefit in limiting the exposure of the teams, either to injury or to illness uh, with the pandemic. So while that was not a focus of the discussion at the conference level, it, it was something that I thought l lended extra weight to this approach. We'll go next to Pat Forty. Uh, Jack, I was just wondering more, this is more of a national question, I guess, but uh, if if you think this has been a successful college football season for college football as a whole, uh, and if so, what have been the, the, the reasons for it to be successful? Um, Pat, it's hard to answer on a national basis. Um, I think it's been successful, more successful than some, than for others. Um, I recognize that the process and decision making, it's, it's the nature of college, athle college athletics, but football in particular, it's so, so diffuse. Um, you know, I, I think we learned a lot, um, as I said at the outset, very proud of what we were able to accomplish in the ACC, I, the decisions we made. I, I think the smartest decision we made um, was to start when we did so that we had room in the schedule um, to, to allow all of us to wind up at the 10 or 11 game mark. Um, I, I, I think had we, had we not given ourselves that flexibility, uh, we never would have been able to get there. And, and that created the opportunity for, um, for, for the student athletes to do that as well. Nationally, I love the way I think we communicated very effectively um, program by program, coach by coach, uh, that we wanted students to only participate if they felt comfortable participating, set rules around the opt-out that allowed it to happen uh, easily. And uh, so I, I, I thought that was a good national element of, of the approach. And as we head into postseason, we're going to continue to have to try and navigate part of, part of evaluating how we did in the year is yet to be answered with what's the postseason going to look like. And I think there are a ton of questions ahead of us in that. And we'll go to a question submitted to us beforehand from Dennis Dodd. Going off your answer before, a chance for you to campaign, he says, if Clemson and Notre Dame split the season, do both deserve to be in the college football playoff? Well, as a member of the CFP Management Committee, I'm really careful not to, not to lobby. I don't, I don't want to be uh, seen as in that position. Um, I think our team's performance speaks for itself. Um, incredibly proud of Brian, his staff, his staff and, and the young men on the team. And um, wherever this season leads, this is going to be among the most memorable in my, in my career just because of all everybody had to sacrifice and do and accomplish. So um, I think this is a really special group of kids, and I'll leave my lobbying to that. I think I, I, I've never been around a group who cared more about each other, who established a better culture, and who played harder, and I've loved every minute being, being with them. We'll go next to Eric Hansen. Hey, Jack. Uh, I know when we talked to you in the summer, you mentioned that there was no playbook for this. Now that you have a playbook with a lot of scribbles in it, probably, are there lessons that you can take from what you learned from being in a conference this year, what you've learned from dodging the pandemic? And also, did you strongly consider maybe opening up attendance at the Syracuse game if the infection numbers hadn't been so high? Uh, let me start with the latter. We didn't. I, I, I recognize that about mid-season I identified that as a hope. Um, but what we found as we progressed through the season was we were really well served by articulating a clear standard as to who we would allow in the stadium. And that was people who were engaged in the campus life every day i.e. they were part of the testing program, they were part of the protocols. And, and so 
establishing that parameter, our own sort of spectator bubble, if you will, really served us well. And, and so it started with students and then extended to faculty and staff. But if you weren't in that cohort, uh, there's an academic word for you, um, you, 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 you know, it, it was a, just a nice place to draw the line. Because you can imagine the, the calls we all fielded, Father John, myself, others, as the season progressed, the people who said, yeah, I, I, I know you got a rule, but just let me come. And, and we were able to, to stay grounded in that principle. And so when we, got, <clears throat> when we got the Syracuse game, it was important to us to maintain the principle. Especially nice, however, that we just distributed the tickets to that game for free to all, all faculty and staff and their families. And we got so much nice follow-up from people who said, gosh, I've never been able to take my whole family to a game. And what an experience it was. So. Um, it was it it worked well it was a we set a standard we stuck to it and it it served us well um yeah the, the if there is a playbook i wrote it in invisible ink um it it continues to change we continue to to reevaluate um you know i don't know that i've learned any lessons that i think will carry forward i think i've become a better manager because I've become incredibly comfortable being wrong, because so often in this, you know, what you thought was right at 10 in the morning was wrong at two in the afternoon. And, and you know, you, you, you learned to be comfortable with that. You learned to have the biggest circle you could for input, because every perspective had some value. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of, General Dempsey, Martin Dempsey's book, Radical Inclusion, uh, about how the more challenging the activity, the greater the need to widen the circle for information. Um, it's the only way you can get to a sort of a reliable conclusion. And, and I certainly found that to be true during this. Um, and then the other thing was to um, not overreact. Um, I think some of the decisions that were made along the way certainly some on our case, but a lot nationally, were overreactions to small pieces of information. And uh, you, you, you had to learn to sort of let it, let it sift through, um, make sure you understood what, what the data point was, who it came from, and whether there were different views uh, to get yourself to the right position. And then finally, uh, I'd just say sort of, being guided by your values. It's never more important than in, in times of crisis or like this, you know, an unprecedented situation. You gotta stay, you gotta stay grounded in, in, in whatever the values of your institution or your organization are. We'll go next to Patrick Engel. Jack, following up on something you had just touched on there and just looking at all the things that navigating an athletic department through all this can throw at you. What were the, easy, the things that you would have considered as easy to overreact to that you were able to kind of find yourself being able to pull back and, and like you said, sift through it? Well, there was a lot. There, there, there was a lot that was presented as scientific information or medical information um, that tended to get misrepresented during this. Uh, not, not by any ill intent. It was just. You know, it was the nature of information flying around, I think, especially in, in some of the national news media. And so really learning to step back and say, wait a second, who can I talk to about this? You know, we, we had a great team of medical experts uh, advising us, importantly, ones that weren't affiliated directly with Notre Dame, um, where you'd you'd get a piece of information that someone else was relying on and you'd say, help me understand it. What, what can you tell me about it? And so um, those, those, those were the clearest examples. And then some of the projections about how the pandemic would progress. Um, you know, the one thing I became convinced about was that we'd have the period we're having now. Everything I read, the historical data with the Spanish flu and everything else I read made me convinced that um, the winter, the flu season, would present a special challenge. 
And so in that regard, that heavily influenced our, our decision to move forward when we did. Um, because I, I didn't see the value in delaying. We'll go next to Tim Priester. Jack, uh, what are your thoughts on the inclusion of the Pac-10 and Big 12 in the college football playoff, considering the disparity in games played? Um, well, of course, as we move for forward, I'm thrilled to know that it may not be that important whether you play 13 or 12 games, um, insert smile here. Um, but, um, you, you know, I, I, I love that the charge to the selection committee doesn't change. It's pick the four best teams. How they do that um, is grounded in the selection procedures that the management committee established, but, but that's the starting premise. And while this year has maybe created a special challenge for that, you know, maybe there's a future year where some unique circumstance at one school, some tragedy of some nature, impacts that school's ability uh, to play the same number of games. And uh, we'll learn from this experience. But I'm, I'm glad there's no exclusion. I'm glad there's no, you got to play X. But I think every game you play is important. It represents a data point. And uh, I, I know the selection committee will use all the data points available to it to pick the, the four best teams in the country. We'll go next to Matt Fortuna. Hi, Jack. Um, curious, were your eyes open to anything in having football be a part of a conference this year? The natural follow-up to that is, does this change any plans about Notre Dame's independence moving forward? And then feel obligated to ask you, uh, if you guys do beat Clemson, do you have plans for what to do with that trophy? <laughs> um, I, I haven't given the latter any thought, so I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for you. Um, it has been a great experience for us. Um, it has been an extension of the ongoing great experience we've had with the ACC. Um, we hope we've been a great member of the conference, but we've certainly enjoyed uh, being a member of the conference and having the opportunities it's presented. Um, you know, I've, I've, I have great, I will take with me great memories of our entire conference experience, winning the men's basketball title, um, the number of women's basketball titles that were won and in a number of sports cross country this year, uh, as an example, our success. Um, and, and football only extended that. Um, and so it was, it was a very positive experience. The things that drive us to independence sort of don't relate to that, right? I mean, the, the reasons that we value independence and it continues to be a priority for us aren't impacted by the positive experience of being in the ACC fully this year. It's just that it serves some other interests of Notre Dame as a university uh, that are very important to us. And so that's why we'll continue uh, to do that. But um, thoroughly enjoyed our experience this year. We'll go next to Tom Noy. Jack, what kind of a financial strain have the last nine months put on your athletic department uh, into the fall and then maybe carrying over into spring and next academic year? Yeah, it's been it, it's been extraordinary. Hard to hard to understate. We are probably as reliant on the income from one sport as any school in the country, and of course, we we largely went without that revenue this year. When you add to that the loss of all a significant portion of all our normal distributions, right? A reduction in the CFP distribution, NCAA distribution. Um, conference distribution, um, it puts you in a very difficult position going forward. And um, we, will, we will deal with the consequences of this year for a long time. Um, we're working hard. I've been so proud of the savings we've been able to engineer. We've been in a hiring freeze, which has really strapped our staff, but they've done a great job. Um, of managing through it. We've cut back everywhere we can. Now, conversely, you 
take on a whole bunch of new expenses related to managing the pandemic. You know, where football used to travel with, with four buses, we now have eight to get spacing on the bus. Um, the testing costs are extraordinary uh, because we've been so aggressive in, in testing on a regular basis. So long-winded way of saying it's impossible to overstate the financial consequence here. We're going to have to reimagine a lot of our business. We're going to have to continue some of the savings we've achieved. And uh, we're going to have to look to our friends to help us. Uh, next week, we're going to host um, our version of a stream telethon um, to try and um, generate a little additional support from a community that already provides extraordinary support to us um, to try and help us navigate through this. It, it, we've dubbed it the fight, and uh, we'll take about five hours on the night of the 15th to, uh, to raise, raise some money to help, help make it through this tough period of time. We'll go next to Dennis Dodd. And Dennis, I believe you're muted. All right, we will circle back to Dennis, but we'll go first to Lou Samoji. Hey, I, can you got me now? Yeah, we, yes, do. we do. I'm sorry. So I did the old man unmute thing. Um, Jack, what, what is the identity of, of Notre Dame football at the moment on the field? You guys are in your best four-year run, I think, since 91. I think that's a great, a, a great question. I love the clarity of it, right? We are, we at Notre Dame like to talk about a certain identity for the team, but we don't all, we haven't always executed on it. But, but this year we very much played to that identity and that strength. We're about the two lines of scrimmage, tight ends, really smart play in the back end on defense and in the back end on offense. And uh, th that's what we've been this year. I think uh, Clark, uh, Coach Kelly set that standard, but the implementation by Tommy Reese and Clark Lee has been remarkable. Um, so proud of the leadership of, of both those coaches and the tone they set. But um, you've seen it. We're, we have been as physical as any team we have faced this year. Um, We've got a lot of talented offensive linemen, including, you know, extending a heritage that populates the NFL with talented alums, um, great tight end play. And I've loved the depth of the rotation on the defensive line. But all that, all that makes, makes for a team with a physical identity um, who doesn't make a lot of mistakes and plays really smart. And, of course, on top of that, we've been led by a quarterback who um, – who, who implements that plan exceptionally well and who brings his own unique set of talents um, that have really helped us succeed this year. So I, I think that's our on-field identity. Our cultural identity is, as I said earlier, a team that is as close and has as much affection for each other as any football team I've been around in my time here. Um, they love each other. They love playing with each other. And you can see that in the field. We'll go next to Lou Samoji. Good afternoon, Jack. Afternoon. Um, I was wondering if I've heard many times from Notre Dame people actually saying to the effect, hmm, maybe it wasn't a bad idea to join the conference. Maybe it's something to uh, contemplate in the future. Have you sensed any groundswell or momentum uh, just in your own dealings and just correspondence of maybe having that attraction in the future, or is that independence status still sacred for football? You know, Lou, I, I can't tell you that I've, I've had any significant outreach one way or another um, during this period of time. You know, I read some of the things people post on social media, and I've seen a little of, of both sentiments expressed, but um, I, don't, I, I don't sense... Um, any change. I guess the one, the one thing I do sense is that because we've played so well over an extended period of time now, I, I, I do think there's, a, there's a, a view among Notre Dame fans that we, we can succeed uh, independently um, and still 
have a shot at postseason in, in the way we want it. So I, I, I think we've helped prove uh, that hypothesis during this three-year run. We'll go next to Eric Hansen. Jack, um, it's going to be fascinating to kind of see how the sausage was made with all this pandemic stuff, the behind the scenes stuff that you guys know about and we'd like to learn more about. But one of those aspects, Brian uh, Kelly referenced on Monday that there seemed to be a shift in how the players' living arrangements were after the September outbreak. Can you shed any light on what the big shift was during and after that outbreak? Yeah, we um, we 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 had to ask people to um, accept different housing arrangements. Um, you, you know, you you it became pis position critical, and so you you couldn't have a group of offensive linemen, a group of tight ends, pick your, pick your position group, all living together because the housing would produce contact tracing if, if one student got sick. And, and, and so we became very intentional about that um, once we saw the consequences in action. Um, there was actually a moment post-game, one, one of the earlier games, where Brian sort of interrupted himself during his post-game comments and said to a couple of guys in the front row, "By the way, you two can't live together anymore." It was it was it was kind of a funny moment, um, but but we had to look at it that way. Um, you, you know what we learned, and I think it's been borne out across the country th th throughout the year, is the risk associated with practice and competition was very small. Um, we just didn't have evidence of transmission of the virus during those periods of time. I'm not saying there hasn't been any. Of course, there, nationwide, there has to have been some. But we, we wound up with some pretty compelling examples, our South Florida game being a particularly good one where uh, we discovered after the game that we had to have had people playing who had, were active with the virus, um, and yet there was no transmission to South Florida. But what we, what we discovered was, you know, sort of what America's discovered or the world's discovered, number one risk time is meals. Um, when you are seated in that environment and engaged in consuming food, um, it presents a special challenge. We had to be very careful about transportation. Um, you know, it would drive me crazy and I'd always follow up with the student athletes, but I'd I'd see a group of student athletes who faithfully wore their masks the entire time they were in the building, then four of them jump in the same car and take their mask off. Um, th those were the times. It was the social engagement that, that created the threat. So we had, to, we had to look at housing differently. We had to look at feeding very differently. Um, so proud of the way everybody pitched in to make that happen. I think, as you know, Eric, when, when we're on the road, we walk into that hotel, the buffet's already set up. It is staffed by members of our staff, by our strength conditioning coach, by Father Nate, um, by our nutritionist, by our recruiting personnel. Um, and they're the ones serving us to minimize the risk. And you take it in a to-go container, you go directly up to your room, and you don't leave your room. It, it, we just had to engineer every piece of those sort of social settings, and housing was one of them. We have time for about two more questions. The first, there's been some interest on getting your take on the one-time transfer rule as well as name, image, and likeness at this point. Well, um, we are in favor of both. Uh, I think it's going on six years ago now, at least five, that Father John gave an interview in the New York Times where he, he said that we, we supported name, image, and likeness for the student athlete based on our fundamental view that we want the experience of the student athlete to be as much like the experience of the non-student athlete at this university as possible. And of course, every other student at Notre Dame can capture their name, image, and likeness value. So as a, as a sort of a baseline proposition, we thought that was really important. Um, you know, the implementation's a mess, and, and sadly so, I think. We've got a number of state laws uh, 
We've got Congress who I think will act uh, this spring in this area. And we've got the NCAA struggling to figure out what the final legislation may look like given that environment. And, and, and so I, I wish the implementation could enjoy a little more clarity than I think it's going to. Um, so I think it'll be a rough first year or so. But, but we support it. We see it as an opportunity to work closely with our student athletes to educate them on how to, how to appropriately maximize name, image, and likeness value. Um, and and we, look, we look forward to doing that. There's going to be a lot to navigate, though. Um, you know, we have got to make sure it doesn't make an already unstable recruiting environment even less stable. Um, and we've got to make sure that it doesn't create unintended consequences where a decision by one student athlete has a negative consequence for the rest of the student athletes or the other members of his or her team. Um, we want to maximize the value here out of it. Um, with regard to the one-time transfer, I'm thrilled. Um, I, I, I couldn't be happier that that's going to be available because I, I found nothing more distasteful in my recent dealings uh, with the, the national rules than the waiver process surrounding transfers. I think it was a system that encouraged young people to make really harmful misrepresentations in, in order to try and gain uh, a, a transfer. And um, we, we, no, we, we should never have sent a message like that to students uh, on a national basis. It became clear what you had to say to get your, your waiver granted. And in fact, we, we saw identical, you know, letters, uh, petitions were just the, the, uh, the grievance name was, was changed, that they just took the facts from some other person and put it in their letter. Um, really, really unseemly stuff that we encouraged by, by the virtue of the national rule. And we will wrap it up this afternoon with Lou Samoji. Yes, I just wanted to ask, uh, I forgot on the first one, but with the financial consequences that you had talked about down the road, do you envision the schedules in non-revenue sports or others uh, maybe becoming more localized? I, everything's on the table. So I, I think um, scheduling is certainly part of that. Can we, can we compete on a more regionalized basis? Obviously, one of the consequences of conference realignment was that geography sort of went out the window, and, and there, there's been a real consequence to that. So how can we deal with that effectively? You know, I think there'll be a lot of discussion about confederating sports, um, which I don't, I don't know how I feel about it right now, but we need to have that discussion. Can we align more closely, for example, with the national governing bodies in some sports to continue to ensure... Uh, opportunity for athletes, um, but perhaps spread the cost a little more effectively. Um, can we develop more partnerships um, that help us? You know, I, I, I find one of the more troubling dynamics of college athletics is that um, colleges and universities bear 100% of the NFL's development cost um, without a contribution from the NFL. In, in all the other pro sports, those leagues bear some measure of the development cost. The NBA with the G League, minor league hockey, minor league baseball, especially the new league, uh, MLB just announced the Wood Bat League. Um, and, and so I think we need to figure out how to, how to have a more fair approach uh, in football. All right, and we will wrap it up there. Thank you very much.